Hello, this is Coach Tim Campbell, and I'm your host for the Self Made is a Myth, Make a Difference Together show, where we're talking with successful business owners to hear their stories of the journey to building their business. And because we know that success in business is not something that we do on our own, we take time to recognize the folks who have helped us to excel. Today, I'm excited to have a fellow business owner from Wisconsin with us today. My guest had a 22-year professional radio career. He's an 80s music master, a craft beer... Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Man, I just messed that up. He just loves craft beer. He is a terrible crossfitter and a golf addict. In the summer, he enjoys golf. In the winter, check this out. He's from Wisconsin, but he's a beloved Chicago Bears fan. Wow. He's going to get beat up on his way home, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> he's most proud of building a business that uses his talents to help a large number of people and making an impact at scale. Today uh, is my pleasure to welcome Pat to the show. Hello, Pat. Howdy, Tim. How are you? Thanks for having me. I am awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, let's start with having you introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit of your personal story, like where you were born and live and about your family and all that fun stuff. Sure. Uh, I'm Pat Miller, the Idea Coach, and I can explain the Bears fandom because I was born in Illinois. I happen ah. to live in Wisconsin now. And when I explain that to Packers fans, they say, how can you be a Bears fan? <laughs> I say to them, could you imagine ever switching allegiances for your team? When they immediately say no, I say, well, I was born in Illinois. And they always go, oh, okay, that makes sense then. Yeah, it does. So I uh, <laughs> grew up living in central Illinois uh, and fell in love with radio broadcasting in college, became a radio guy, building radio stations, coaching air talents, and being on the air. Moved all around the Midwest doing that. Ended up here in Milwaukee with a great opportunity. Did that for, I think, 12 years. And then four years ago, I said, you know what? Uh, I want to go build something for myself. And I left the radio industry to go uh, take what I had learned to consult small businesses. Best decision, well, second best decision I ever made. Best decision was marrying my lovely wife and our family. <laughs> Good that recovery. Brought. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's uh, keeping me out of the doghouse there. But it's true. <laughs> The second best decision was leaving the radio industry and starting my own small business consulting firm that's now turned into a community. And uh, it's just the happiest and most fulfilled I've ever been. Wonderful. So uh, tell us how long have you been married and what's your beautiful wife's name? Yes, Abby Miller. Uh, she is a photographer, owns her own studio here. Uh, we've been married now for 21 years, going to be 22 years. See, we married in 2000, so I never have to worry about <laughs> how many years it's been. So our 22nd wedding anniversary is coming up in August. Congratulations. So Pat, is there a funny story that your family likes to share about you that you'd be willing to divulge? Yeah, my sister and I were really competitive, always competitive. And it kind of has bled over into all the facets of my life. If we're going to play a game, I want to win. <laughs> and going back to when I was a kid, which was many, many years ago, uh, we would turn on the radio and we would play name that tune. And if you've ever played name that tune, you bid back and forth on how many notes you need to name the tune. I can name it in 10, I can name it in nine, I can name it in eight. Well, my sister and I got so competitive. At one point, I just said, I can name it in no notes. And the family thought that was the funniest thing ever. Of course, I got it wrong. But <laughs> it spoke to how much my sister and I were competitive with one another, which has fueled a lot of my professional career. <laughs> That's awesome. I remember... Uh playing Monopoly with my sister and it got so bad that my mom had to keep taking the game away from us and giving us a timeout. Absolutely. What do you mean you won't trade with me? Come on, this is a fair deal. What do you mean you won't trade? Oh, that exactly. would be awful. Yeah. <laughs> so Pat, um, tell us how, about how the business came about and more importantly, when you had the, the confidence that you could run your own business. Well, confidence and business success are two different things, right? I'm sure you coach people on that. Um, so I had the idea to leave the radio stations. I had this awakening one day. I guess it was a borderline midlife crisis of saying, why am I taking my time and my talent and building somebody else's dream? Mm. That's not a thing. That's not a thing. I was really tired of having my ideas redirected in ways I didn't think they should go. 
and the energy that I was putting out, making big programs and selling big deals, but not making any money on them. Mm. So it kind of just wore me down to the point of, I can't keep doing this. And if I look up 10 years from now and I'm still a radio guy, but have nothing for myself, I will regret it. So that's when I left the radio stations to start consulting small businesses. And as far as the confidence to do what I'm doing, the first 90 days are super scary. Mm -hmm. And it took me about 90 days to go from, hey, everyone, I'm doing my own thing to having my first paying client. And between A and B was a lot of networking and self-discovery, healing as well, right? Trying to get out of the corporate mindset and get into the entrepreneurial mindset. But once I landed that first client and started uh, helping her launch her travel business and she started to have success, that's when I started to realize, okay, I might be able to do this. And of course, I've had massive failures along the way and ups and downs. It's not like it was an instant success, but that's when the confidence started to build when I started to get success for a client based on what I was providing for her. I love that because uh, you said I didn't have necessarily have the confidence until after the fact. So what gave you the, the, uh, the, Oh, it's okay to take this step. How, what, how, talk us through that. Yeah. I'm very fortunate that Abby, my wife is in my life. Mm. I was miserable for the last few years of my radio career as I became more and more creatively frustrated. It got to the point where I didn't want to go to work. I wasn't doing my best work. I wasn't very happy. And she had been begging me for years to make a change. When it finally got to the point of, should I make a change? She was the one that said, listen, my photography business is doing well enough. We will get by, uh, but you need to go make a change that is going to feed you and fulfill you. So having her as my partner, she's the one that kind of pushed me out of the nest to go do this. That's what gave me the initial confidence. And then the second part of it was, um, and I'm sure you'd be the same thing if you weren't uh, with Action Coach and you weren't a coach, you could go get a job again with Sargento or whomever. You've got the talents and skills to be employable. Sure. So I knew that at worst, Johnson Controls or some big company would need a marketing guy. So I knew at worst I could find a job, but I didn't want a job. So with her backing and the confidence that I could always go back to radio or something else, that's when I decided to make the leap. I love that. My wife, I have a similar story with her, she it got down to the point where I was like, but honey, maybe you don't understand what if we can't afford the house? And she said, but Tim, I make enough to rent an apartment. So go chase your dream. <laughs> and isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Because when we have conversations like this, it's really easy not to have that transparent, real look into the genesis of what we're doing. Because it's easy to say, well, I just knew I could go help entrepreneurs and blah, 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 blah. No, there was a very vulnerable point where I was scared to death yeah. and still scared, always scared. Yeah. <laughs> but when you have good people and good systems around you, you know, it, it's something that's manageable. That's awesome. So Pat, tell us a little bit more about the company and what you're doing now. It started as one-on-one -on -one consulting. I was helping entrepreneurs and coaching them and helping them grow their business by defining their customer and finding a way to position themselves in a unique way other than everybody else. But when the pandemic hit, my business changed and it didn't change because I needed to change it. Opportunity arose. So the pandemic hit, uh, the NBA cancels its season. Tom Hanks gets COVID. That all happened within like two days or one day of one another. And everyone knew, oh my goodness, something's going on. In fact, it was so long ago, we called it coronavirus when that happened. It wasn't COVID. <laughs> everyone freaked out and all of our business support systems melted. Mm. Our coaching programs didn't know what to do. Our networking programs all went on ice. Everything stopped. Yeah. So I started doing a daily Zoom call called Small Business Rally Point. And the whole genesis of the idea, the whole theme was, we don't know what's going to happen. But if we stick together, we use an abundance mindset, we help one another, and we're positive, we will get through this. So this daily call went on for 90 days. And after 90 days, it turned into an online community. And now my core business is the Idea Collective Small Business Incubator that brings people together to help them grow their businesses as a group. Uh, and it's just been so fulfilling and so much fun.
And that's where you said in the intro that I help people at scale. That's how I get the chance to help people at scale. That's awesome. So uh, a lot of folks during COVID kind of put their head in the sand and said, we're just going to wait this out. And, you know, it's only going to be a couple of weeks. And unfortunately, it was a couple of years. So, so you didn't do that. You pivoted and, and took full advantage of it. Congratulations. Well, I appreciate that. And I wish I could say I was smart enough to know this is what it was going to turn into. I did it. I just started doing the show because it's what came natural to me sure. because of my background. Yeah. Doing a daily show was no big deal. In fact, I don't have online meetings. I don't have webinars. It's always a show because that puts me in the right mindset to serve the folks that come on and make sure that it's engaging and entertaining. So as I was doing this show, someone in the community said, hey, you've created a community here. So there was a community of people before I even called it that. Yeah. Then when I launched the online community, people rushed in and now we are where we are. That's wow. (laughs) So Pat, um, tell us a story where someone pushed you uh, that you could do something maybe that you didn't realize even that you could do and the impact that they had on you. That is a great question. I remember my college advisor, Deb Lesser, one of my great mentors. I was not very confident uh, and I was not really sure how I was going to get to where I wanted to go. And she continually pushed me to develop my leadership skills and put myself out there as someone that can lead others. Mm -hmm. I always knew I could do it, but I didn't have a lot of confidence. And she continually pushed me through higher and higher levels of leadership through the college radio station to the point where my senior year, I was the general manager, which was the top spot. And she helped not only push me to step into that leadership position, she also helped me shape what leadership was all about and how you make it not about you, you make it about everyone else Mm -hmm. and what it takes to be successful. So it's not the most crazy off the wall example, but Deb is still to this day, someone that's incredibly special to me. She changed my life. Wow. And uh, I'm still grateful for her pushing me the way that she did. That's amazing how probably in her mind, she's just doing her job, right? Just doing what she's supposed to do and the incredible life-changing impact that that's had for you. And isn't that what we do as coaches? that we say something that comes natural to us because we're observational and we're empathetic and we're thinking about their best interests. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our clients aren't thinking that way. They're worried about the invoice they have to pay, or they're worried about the product they have to kick out. And when you get them to stop and you can provide the gift of perspective, Mm -hmm. sometimes you'll unlock something that they can't see for themselves. She did that for me. And man, if I can do that for other people, I'd feel very fortunate. I like that comparison because we see it the same thing so often that it's just second nature for us to say, Hey, but did you think of that? Right. Um, But you're right. Our clients have only seen it for the first time and don't, don't understand. Right. They they just can't see what they can't see. Yeah. That's why they need us. Right. And not like they need us like, Oh, I'm so smart. I don't mean it that way. (laughs) Everyone needs a coach. You need a coach. If you don't have a coach, you should get a coach because that perspective is so valuable and you'll go so much further, so much faster. If you set aside your ego and get someone else's opinion, it'll unlock a lot. Yeah. I, you know, in fact, I've heard many times and I fell into this trap too of, well, but I can't afford it. And I can say for certain that I wouldn't, my business wouldn't be here today if I didn't have a coach. Um, and so I couldn't, I can't not afford it. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. Coaching is an investment that has a real ROI. Every time I've hired someone, every time without fail, I've made money on that investment. And I would challenge anyone that hires a coach, if they have a good fit to not see the same result in their business, it's invaluable. So Pat, um, what's been your biggest learning as a business owner? Whew. You know, we had a very small one. Can I share it? Like, it's not the biggest, but it's been the most impactful. Yeah. Like I didn't have some awakening that changed my business, but my wife and I did something in our business that might help out another solopreneur or a solopreneur couple like we are. So she has her photography business and I have my consulting business. 
And for the first few years we were doing what we're doing, it was how much can you draw this month? How much are you going to pay us this month? And some months it was a lot and some months it was not. And at some point we stumbled across the idea and I wish I could remember who gave it to us because I'd love to attribute it. But what we created was an owner's comp account from the Mike McCallowitz School of uh, Profit First, but prepaying that owner's comp account, but then only drawing a paycheck out of it. Mm. So we went from how much money is in the owner's comp, bring it home, and a variable income to funding the owner's comp account and then taking regular paychecks out of it. Now, I know that sounds like not a big deal, but when you start paying yourself a set amount every month or every two weeks, you end up understanding that you can pre-fund your paycheck. So you're not going month to month with how much money you get to bring home, if you're doing well, you can start rolling up 30, 60, 90, 120 days of your paycheck. And it lowers your drama so much. It gives us so much peace. And I know that's not some big breakthrough, but for my wife and I, totally changed the way that we operate what we do. And the, the, the awesome thing about that is the business will grow into the expenses that it needs to pay, right? And so to, to elaborate on what you're saying is everybody should be paying themselves on a regular basis as opposed to draws, even if it's just $20 a month, right? And then next month, maybe it's 21 and then it's 50 and whatever it is, right? Because the business will, will absorb it. And, and as long as we're you know, doing all the other things that we're supposed to in our business, it, you know, it'll take care of itself. I, I love that. So um, how long have you, when did you have that aha and how long has that been uh, working for you? It was last fall when we really instituted it. Yeah. My wife does portrait photography, which is really two things, business headshots and senior pictures, high school seniors. Yeah. Well, the high school senior season is July to December 1st, essentially. And she would have huge seasonality in her revenue. She would be killing it in Q3 and Q4. Q1 and early Q2 is a little bit you know, more lean. Yeah. And we would do great in Q3 and Q4 and pile up a bunch of money, but then we'd have to live off it like squirrels through the winter. <laughs> right. So, right? so we had this idea, wait a minute, what if we could prepay January, February, and March in the fall rather than harvesting all this revenue? So we kicked it in this year and it's totally changed everything that we're doing. I can't recommend it enough, not necessarily because we have money in the bank. Well, that's nice. The emotional stakes have gotten so much lower because we don't have to worry about if we'll have money in the bank. Yes. It, it almost sets you up to be more like when we were in the corporate world, right? Of Well, the paycheck's going to keep coming because look, we've got a cash reserve to keep paying ourselves. Absolutely. I love it. Congratulations. Thank you. So Pat, we know business success doesn't happen in isolation. So tell us about one of your challenges during the, the years and maybe a fellow business owner that uh, came alongside you and helped you through that. That is the theme of the Idea Collective. Our phrase is don't grow it alone. Mm. And going back to the launch of the Idea Collective, I think that would be the best example of how people got around me and changed, completely transformed my business and every great idea that has come from it has come from the community. Uh, it's part of you know community management and leadership is making sure you're putting things in front of people and letting them guide you with what they want. But as I was explaining, the small business rally point turned into the community. It was a community member who told me, hey, you should start a paid online community because nothing like that exists around here and you should start bringing people together. So it wasn't even my idea. After that happened, I got people together on a Zoom call and said, okay, Jennifer has shared this idea. I would like to make this happen. What do you think? And yeah. they helped me create the initial structure of what the idea collective was going to be, what it was not going to be, and how it was going to move forward. And then the other big innovation was our in-person retreat that we do every year in November. That also started with member focus groups. Mm -hmm. What would you want out of the retreat? How could we make it great? And then follow up meetings after the retreat, what was good, what wasn't good. Yeah. And it's a continual iteration of casting a vision, but asking for advice along the way. 
let's give a shout out to you. I think you said her name was Jennifer. What's her last name? If you... Oh yeah. Jennifer Buchholz, JB. She's the bomb. She is one of those folks that you find in your business. We call each other our business BFFs. Uh, you just find a person that is, um, that you vibe with personally and professionally, and you just help one another with no expectation in return. She has been an absolute godsend with what I'm doing. I met her at my very first in-person networking event, even before I left the radio stations. We bonded instantly. So I love JB. She's been a huge influence in my business. And I hope that I've made that kind of impression on others at some points as well. I love it. So um, Pat, if I asked you to pick three people who have helped you in your business journey that you're most grateful for, who are those three and um, how did they help you? I would start with my wife, as I explained earlier. She's my daily coach and consultant. We do, I think, a pretty good job of talking through what needs to happen in the business, reflecting on what worked and didn't work. And she's the one that gives meaning to everything that I'm doing. None of this matters if it's not a success for my wife and my family. So we get to plan, react, and celebrate together. So I couldn't go on without her. And she's been the most influential person to me uh, so far. I'd also say my parents. I'm going to count those two people as one. But uh, my mother is very pragmatic. She has a phrase that she uses called do it or don't. And I think it's fantastic. <laughs> if you want to be something, if you want change in the world, then go do it or don't, but you get to make the decision about your activity. Mm -hmm. My father, he's always guided me with one simple phrase of do your best. Every day from being a you know four-year-old going off to preschool all the way until today, he'll say, do your best, which sets a personal standard, which means I'm not going to judge what you do. You judge what you've done. Mm -hmm. Are you doing your best? Yeah. And it helps guide my performance to make sure I don't cut corners and to make sure that I'm going as far as I can for each of my clients. Hey, Pat, and then the, what, are your, what are your parents' names? Oh, Jim and Lana, Jim and Lana Miller. They are fabulous. I'm fortunate that they live here in uh, Wisconsin with me as well. And we get a chance to, you know, uh, just be a part of each other's lives, which is a real gift at this point. And I got a third person, but it's kind of cheating. It, the third person is my community. Ah. For the reasons that we just explained, to have a group of people that I'm walking with every day where we can collaborate with one another and we can uh, give each other the gift of belonging and connection and collaboration, uh, it's just, it's wonderful. I feel truly blessed to have this series of events happen that have led me to having a group like this around me. That's amazing. And I think you said earlier that you guys get together both virtually and in person. Is that correct? The community is virtual only on purpose because we have members all around the country and all around the world. The one time a year we get together is at the Idea Collective Retreat in November. So it's an online group exclusively with one big meeting each year. Okay, fantastic. So Pat, as you think about the, the next three to five years and maybe some of the biggest challenges that you're going to face to reach your goals, who are the types of people that you're going to need to help you get through those challenges? I need to continue to invite people into the community because communities get better as they get bigger, not worse. You don't water down a community with more members. You empower a community with more members. So that's mission one, to bring people into the community to share the vision and help enrich it with energy and connection. And then the other thing that I want in the next three to five years is I want my podcast to be a radio show and I want that radio show to be nationwide. My heart is still in being a broadcaster and the podcast that I do called the Pat Miller show is a caller driven show where we're coaching people on their business live without a net. Mm. And it's fantastic. It's the most fun of all the stuff I get to do. And I know I want that to be on the air. So I am trying to connect with the people that can help make syndication happen, make airtime happen, and get this show out there. One, because I love it. Mm -hmm. But two, as you know, conversations where people get a second opinion and get feedback on what they're building are really crucial. And the small business support system kind of sucks. <laughs> we need this conversation to be on the air. We need entrepreneurs who are in Nashville and Indianapolis and Peoria, Illinois, to know they're not alone, that people are out there trying to support them as they build their small business dream 
That's why the show needs to exist. And that's what I want to see happen. I love it. We, um, I talk a lot about the fact that the school system teaches us how to be employees, not how to be you know, entrepreneurs, right? And so I love what you're doing to get that word out that, you know, there are resources, there are options to, to learn. And you mentioned earlier the, the abundance idea. Right? And so for those who, who learn how to run great businesses, the sky's really the limit because there are a lot, all of us who went into business for ourselves, you know, most of us just kind of stumbled into it and are figuring it out as we go. But to your point, there are options for folks to learn how to run a better business. And it's just a matter of them having the opportunity to hear about it, right? Uh-huh. Absolutely. And isn't it exciting and terrifying at the same time to think that we can do anything? Hmm. The only thing that's limiting limiting us is what's in our head. Yeah. Our mentality and our daily actions can result in becoming the leader of the free world if we want to, yeah. or staying in our own little box where we are if we don't unlock it. And the abundance mindset of you can go as far as your time and talent take you is so exciting to me. It's so exciting. <laughs> I just want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to unlock it in myself and unlock it in others. I've been on a, a mindset uh, journey over the past 18 months uh, doing specific uh, manifesting and mindset coaching in a group setting. And wow, um, I would say 18 months ago, I was kind of a check the box on the, the exercise because it, it is something that we coach. And then I fully got into it and just have realized the power right, of what we tell ourselves in our head you know, the law of attraction, the, you know, what the energy we put out is the energy we attract. And it's just incredible when, to your point of once we start to understand the power of unleashing that, it's just mind boggling. It absolutely is. And sometimes you have to say things out loud that make people go, really? Like, I want to be on the air nationwide in three to five years. Uh -huh. Really? No. Yeah, really. And I'm going to do everything I can to make it happen. And I hope Everyone has goals like that, that they think are unreachable. Good. Let's go reach them. Because yeah. that's the fun part. That's the fun part. Uh, yeah. If you want to build a business that pays the bills, we can do that. If you want to make money, you can go get hired by a corporation. That's not fun and exciting. If you want to build something that's meaningful, something that's legendary, we only get one trip. This is the only ride we get to take. <laughs> right. So as my mom would say, do it or don't. Yeah. Right. It's interesting going back to the employee reference that I talked about earlier. So in the corporate world, we're taught to under promise and over deliver. Right. And so then when we become entrepreneurs, we're, there's almost a hardwiring that we can't think that big, right? You can't think, you can't develop a goal that's beyond what you believe that you can achieve because that would just be crazy. <laughs> and then then that ends up, most of us set those achievable goals. And guess what? We just achieve those achievable goals. <laughs> yeah. They're not exciting, but they're complete as though you're going to get a review from your boss. We joke about that all the time in the community. Uh, well, go ask the boss if you can have the day off. Go ask the boss if you can take a week <laughs> off. Go ask the boss if you can get a raise. And then you remember, oh yeah, that's me. Yes. So I, that's, a, that's a really good point. So this will, um, obviously, we've talked already a lot about community. Jim Rohn, one of my favorite authors, says we become the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. So as you reflect on that, and it's, it's, I, I would assume it's a lot of what you're already doing, what does that mean from your perspective? It means I got to push myself by bringing people in who are just better than I am, smarter than I am, further along in the book than I am. Uh, when I finally hired a sales coach, Aaron Marcus, changed my business, doubled my revenue in less than a year because she unlocked some of the things that I was telling myself. Oh, no one would ever pay that. No one would ever want to be in that program. No one would ever want to. Not only did they want to, they sold within like a week of putting them out there. <laughs> so no, I'm a big believer in finding those people. And that comes to something that I, looking back on it, I did a terrible job. Uh, when I was in radio, I don't know if it was ego or being defensive or whatever, but there were a lot of ways that I could have just learned from what others were doing and been a better employee rather than 
trying to create a new way of doing things and coming up with my own method, I would have gone a lot further had I done that. And I don't regret it, but I'm sure I was not an easy employee to manage (laughs) because they would tell me to go do the thing. And I would say, well, what about this thing? No, just go do the thing. And that frustrated me. Yeah. (laughs) So looking back on it, it was a mistake that I made in corporate. But like you say, now that we're out on our own, it's a great thing. So yeah. maybe I was destined for it and didn't realize. <laughs> I, I remember back uh, in the corporate world, the the if a, an executive coach was often um, thought of as that person's getting in trouble, right? They they need outside help, right? Or they're going to get let go, as opposed to a true gift and and an enabler for people to to excel in their roles. Absolutely, getting coached was a weakness. Yes, like a. Pr- performance improvement plan or something like you weren't naturally gifted enough to figure out all of these dynamics on your own. Well, no, no, I wasn't. And, (laughs) you know, getting coached, I wish I would have been coached back then because I probably would have been a much better employee. And now that I'm thinking about it, I wonder if I ever would have left Mm. if I was more successful. So maybe everything happens for a reason, as my wife says. So the reason indeed. Yes. And isn't it weird that in sports, right? You would never think of any professional athlete not having a coach, but for some reason, there's this paradigm that in the corporate world, it's weird. (laughs) Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're exactly right. And it's something that maybe should be normalized or injected more often, uh, that you're finding people to improve the people you have, because we all know how expensive it is and hard it is to find people uh, that you don't have to go hire someone. It's not cheap and it's not easy right now. No, it sure isn't. It is a very weird and upside down crazy world right now. And at the same time, there's a ton of entrepreneurs that are just crushing it. And so um, I appreciate uh, you sharing some of your stories. Pat, last question here. If there was something catastrophic that happened um, in the business, who's the first person you call and what would you want from them? I think the first thing I would do is bring the community together. Mm. The position of community leader and community founder is different than audience member or audience leader. If you have an audience, let's say your podcast takes off and people love listening to you, people love to hear what you have to say, but they're not really invested in your success because they're there to listen to you and not talk with one another. When you're a community leader, you need to cast a vision where we're going, drive the purpose, defend the values, create a safe space for everyone to meet. Mm. But you also, I feel, at least the way I'm trying to do it, is to be on the journey with them. Just because I'm the leader doesn't mean I'm not one of them. So if something really bad happened, I would bring them together. And I would hope that they would show up for me in the ways that I've tried to show up for them, which is kindness, consideration, support. Uh, And and it's a very special place that we've built. And I'm confident that they would be there for me. So that's what I would do. I I would get the group together and say, here's the thing that happened. What should we do? And trust the wisdom of the crowd that we would figure it out. I love your perspective of we're, we're all in this together. Yes. You're you've, you created it and you're leading it. But um, I, what I just heard you say is that you're, you don't feel like you're any different or better than you just happen to be the one who stepped up to, to take the lead. Absolutely. And what's funny is we have members in London. We have members in Tasmania. We have members in Victoria, British Columbia. And when we talk to all of those entrepreneurs, they're all going through the same stuff. Yes, They're all dealing with imposter syndrome. They're all dealing with price constraints in their head, not in their business. They're dealing with organization and social media and uh, overwhelm and emotional support and not celebrating their wins. Big one. Got to celebrate your wins. Uh, And it all comes around the idea that a lot of small business owners, they don't fail because they run out of money. They fail because they run out of energy. Yes. And they just give up because it's easier to go back to corporate. Yes. I don't want that to happen. So that's where the community can really keep people on track. Yeah. They're, they're, everyone knows the crazy stat of you know 80% of businesses fail. But what most people probably don't know, you just mentioned, is the number one reason for that is burnout, which is 
you know, very, very frustrating because it doesn't have to be that way. You know, the whole, there's a lot of celebration of the hustle and grind, right? Mentality. And, and yes, in the first year, there's, there is going to be some hustle and grind that's required to get things up and running and right and, and figure things out and trial and error, but it's not sustainable, right? Those 60, 70, 80 hour weeks just can't happen year over year, over year, over year. And unfortunately, uh, too many people are fall in love with that concept. And uh, there's a great book, the, what got us, what got you here, won't get you there. Mm. And that's, that plays off of that principle of the, how I've interpreted it anyway, is the hustle and grind that got you to, you know, have a, a workable business is not what's going to allow you to have a scalable, sustainable business. Hustle and grind makes me crazy. It makes me crazy. It makes me see spots. It makes me so mad. And I think one of the things that it misses sometimes is I forget the name of the principle, but the uh, work will expand to the time that you give it, Mm -hmm. right? That if you're going to say, I'm going to work a 60 or 70 hour week, you're always going to work a 60 or 70 hour week, but that doesn't mean you're doing 60 or 70 hours of quality work. It just means you're working that long. The other thing that I think it misses is why the hell are we doing this? <laughs> Honestly, I'm not building my business so I can work on my business. I'm building my business so I can live my life. Yes, right. One of the most valuable, if not the most valuable piece of pieces of compensation we get as a solopreneur is time yeah. and the ability to control our schedule. Hey, I have no meetings Wednesday morning. You know what I'm going to do? Play golf. You know why? Because I can. (laughs) And that's compensation. (laughs) So, you know, if people practice hustle and grind and they make more money, God bless. That's not (laughs) the way that I look at doing this. And I want people to have a great life and run a business, not the other way around. Amen. Pat, you've been blessed with some incredible people, it sounds like, that have helped you on your journey. If they were all on the show here today, what would you want to say to them? Oh, man. I'm nothing without my family. I'm nothing without my community. When you put yourself out there, like you do on this podcast, or like I do when I do my show and stuff, to know that a group of people has your back, and they will give you the feedback that you need when you need it, but they'll do it with care is something magical. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful that there all these people um, are walking with me. And that's the theme of your show, isn't it? Don't do it alone. It's the theme of our community. Don't grow it alone. So I'm grateful. I'm appreciative. And I hope that I can give back to them what they give to me. I love it. Pat, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, It's an honor. Thank you very much. To everyone who tuned in, thanks for listening to the Self Made is a Myth show with your host, Coach Tim Campbell. Be sure to help us spread the movement by liking the show and featuring it on your social media. And to join our movement, go to bemadtogether.com. All right, folks, that's a wrap. Make sure to pay it forward, and I'll see you all next time. Take care. <laughs>